Well, finally, we are going to see what is going to happen uh, on election day. Uh, we are now fighting to get an as strong result as possible. In 2019, as Greens, uh, we had a very big election result uh, across Europe, mostly in the west and the east of Europe, in the west and the and the north of Europe. Um, and we are trying now to basically get back into um, working towards having a similar election result also in 2024. Indeed. Um, there are challenges ahead of us right now. The Green Deal is not something that is theoretical in the future. It is something um, that we are implementing as we speak. Um, and we believe we need to do even more to implement it and to do it in a socially just way. Um, we are aware of uh, the discussions, sometimes difficult discussions there, are, um, but we still think that the threat of climate change, the threat of the ecological crisis that we are facing uh, has not gone away, it has not gotten less, um, and we still want to do everything we can, not only to stand up to the climate crisis, but also to build a resilient economic future in Europe. The problem here, though, is that what we're seeing is that European voters are more interested in the narrative from far-right parties at this stage. And we're actually seeing European policymakers that are currently in, in the jobs making some changes to these climate targets. So are we going to see a European Union that is less climate friendly after the election? You see now reversing what has been done in the Green Deal would not only be a catastrophic from a climate and an eco uh, ecological point of view, but also from an economic point of view. Because we see that, you know, of course, this green transformation is not something that happens within five years. It is not something that is a quick fix. It is something that needs planning. And this is why also from an economic perspective, it is of utmost importance that we continue on this path, that we make sure that investors, that companies, that businesses, that industry knows that in Europe you have a certain level of predictability and um, that we create an environment where um, investment is, is attracted because we need to invest in green technologies, in green economy, because these are the markets of the future. Um, and this is why we want to create uh, stability when it comes to the discussions around the Green Deal, rather than what center-right, and as you're rightfully saying, also far-right is trying to do now, basically rolling back on the achievements. Plus, and I want to be very explicit about that, we also believe um, that it needs more investment on a European level in order to make the Green Deal a success. We have now put the targets uh, into, into law, we have uh, put regulations. Now we need the enabling side of the Green Deal. We need investments in infrastructure. We need investment into a renovation wave across Europe so that we can not only write things into laws, but that we can actually make it a reality in practice. And this is what's going to be the big challenge of the next legislature, how we can make that possible. But the question for you at this stage is how are you going to convince European voters that this is a priority when so far they have been facing higher prices? You hear farmers protesting across all of the European Union. How do you tell voters that this actually matters for them and that actually their domestic priorities should not be a focus for the EU at this stage? Absolutely. I believe that we have to make sure that voters understand that the Green Deal is not about something abstract. Um, it is about something that affects their everyday lives. If you look at um, the reality in uh, large parts of th southern Europe where we see forest fires um, every summer now, if you look at the floodings, if you look at the realities of extreme weather events, this is not something theoretical. This is something that is affect affecting people's lives uh, as we speak. We see that Europe is the continent that is warming up the fastest across the world so we will see these effects um, in our everyday lives um, and this has to be at the center of trying to avoid the worst from happening but i think we also have to link it to other issues you rightfully said uh, you rightfully talked about invasion, uh, inflation uh, and the cost of living crisis of course this has to do also with the fact that in Europe we were, because we haven't taken the steps in the past, uh, very much dependent, for example, on fossil imports from countries like Russia. Uh, and we have seen uh, with the aggression in Ukraine, 
how uh, easily uh, it is uh, to put pressure on European countries exactly because of this dependency. So the Green Deal is not only about meeting climate targets, it is also about having a sustainable, a resilient economic basis in Europe to have energy that we can depend on, uh, like solar, like wind energy, um, and to uh, create a situation where in times of you know a growing insecurity on the global scale um, we are not um, you know uh, we are not in the hands of people like vladimir putin uh, when it comes to our um, to our economic future so there is also a very strong security argument in why we should continue the green deal right well Ursula von der Leyen, she was a champion for the Green Deal, and yet she has changed her narrative slightly in recent times in the wake of the protests from the farmers and so on. I was just wondering whether the Green Party will actually support Ursula von der Leyen as the next president of the European Commission. Well, you see, it is very interesting if you look at the narratives that are coming from EPP, including Ursula von der Leyen right now, because on the one hand, they're trying to frame themselves as the party of the Green Deal. And on the other hand, they want to basically reverse and roll back on a lot of the achievements of the Green Deal. So I think there is a very unclear narrative what EPP actually wants. For us, it is very clear one precondition for, for example, supporting uh, Ursula von der Leyen to be Commission President again, will be that obviously we continue down this path of the Green Deal, we continue down this path of climate neutrality for Europe, out of the obvious ecological arguments, out of economic arguments and out of security arguments. And um, there will be negotiations after the elections. We don't know how the elections are going to go. Um, but for us, it is absolutely clear to be part of a majority for, for example, Ursula von der Leyen, we have to uh, strengthen and we have to continue the Green Deal. And we also have to bring the necessary investment in order to build uh, a Europe that is ready for the future. So you would be ready to support her in another mandate if she promises to you that she'll continue to deliver on the Green Deal, even though recently she has changed some of her narrative? Well, you know, now it's election time. Um, obviously, inside of EPP, there is an internal struggle about how, to, how, how they want to position themselves when it comes to the Green Deal. I can reassure you that as Greens, we are very clear on how we want to position ourselves. Um, and we will only be part of a majority and we will only vote for a candidate, be it Ursula von der Leyen or somebody else, if there is a very clear commitment, a written down commitment on continuing on the Green Deal and doing what is necessary in order to make the Green Deal a reality. And just finally, I would like to get your thoughts on what's happening in the Netherlands in the context of the European elections. We saw Gert Wilders essentially taking a step back from potentially becoming the next prime minister of the Netherlands. I was just wondering, what does this case show to you? Does it give any sort of inspiration to some extent on what might happen at the EU level post the European elections? I think it mostly proves one point, and that is a very important point, that uh, if we want to build a constructive future inside of Europe, nationalists as authoritarian parties and far-right parties are not part of the solution. Because basically, uh, obviously, they can run populistic divisive campaigns, but at the end of the day, when we are trying to find actual solutions that can work across Europe, and we are not only talking about climate change here, we have a lot of challenges ahead of us as Europeans. Uh, Far-right parties are the ones that are blocking moving forward, that are making majorities impossible. And we want, uh, because of that, to build pro-European democratic majorities. And this is basically the decision that at the end of the day, citizens have when they vote for the European elections in June. Do they want to have a European Union that is blocked? Do, do, you, do they want to have a European Union that is infighting? Or do they want to have a European Union that moves ahead, that solves the issues that are there, and that does that in a constructive way amongst pro-European Democrats. And I can tell you very clearly which my priority is.